Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people of this beautiful planet. Welcome back to the uh, I'm Eric and Mark for the Beauties for what was a very busy weekend on the Rift in many regions. And we're starting with, I'm not going to call it, it's not the bad, it's not the ugly, it's the not so good, maybe slightly concerning T1 Summer Saga. They dropped their third straight series in a row, two of them now of those three coming to Honda life. And unfortunately, they drop another, you know, series along the way that looks probably as bad as they have looked throughout this uh, rough stretch. And yes, another resounding loss to Hanwha life at this point is the is the thing that capitalizes on it and does lead you to start to feel like that grasp on number two of the LCK has really started to slip for this T1 and they're really in danger of not being able to get it together in time to reclaim that type of positioning in the LCK. A squad like Hanwha Life, D plus Kia that we have seen certainly surging up and looking to be the challengers. I think the big thing everyone is somehow forgetting when we look back and say, yeah, they slumped the last slump summer too and turned it around for Worlds. They were slumping because Faker wasn't playing because he was injured. Baker's playing through this slump, and some of these dives T1 were trying out in life were absolutely uh, egregious. It's not just Zeus 05 NAR to be blaming for this. Even guys like Kyria, owner gets the Nidalee a couple of games in this series to have some early game prio, and these dives are just bad. And there's a difference between trying to cook up these dives at a purely aggression. That this is you're trying to make an aggressive move, proactive moves around the map, and, and you're trying to overforce or something doesn't go. These are coming through from desperation on T1 that they feel they need to make these type of moves in order to make that traction, to have a position in these later uh, parts of the game. And they're risking it on these type of pull-offs and they're not getting it in these uh, dives. I think when you're looking through at the individual performances, almost all across the board, it has slipped up, uh, you know, which is the craziest thing to look at because I think individually, Gumiyushi was certainly the last member uh, of this team that I think that has kind of dropped down in performances and, and struggled. But I think with what has gone on with the other four members of this team, it has pushed Gumiyushi into this one of these positions where he now is in that desperation mode as well, trying to do too much, trying to take these chances that you normally might not take or, you know, in this situation and just forcing it too much. And especially now with, well, Hanwha beating them twice, being on the up and up, we'll get to D pluses, resurgence, and now it's it's feeling pretty much slotted in that T1's the fourth best team in the LCK, if they're lucky, if you're not buying into the KDF KT hype. And then you, you think about it, right? And you realize, okay, well, where do you find where are you going to find this power? Where are you going to find that rebound from this organization, this thing? You don't really see a path to it outside of getting a break, getting some time to refresh, relax, step away, and come back in refreshed to reapproach it. Because right now, this nonstop run that they've been on since winning the world championship, that's not going to be able to be uh, achieved once again. You're... <sighs> I mean... Maybe you don't want a deep playoff run. Maybe you want a couple weeks at least off and hope that they're qualifying uh, for regional uh, finals through to get to Worlds. So obviously, that's a little bit dramatic. We still got like eight series, four weeks to play in the LCK. And it does seem like a similar storyline to us talking about last summer where they did eventually turn things on. But again, this is with the main starting five and they're not looking good uh, whatsoever the last couple of weeks D plus Kia, as we alluded to, Honda Life is great. D plus is right there behind them now in some elite company as the only team to take a game off of Gen G in the summer split. And Mark, they were close to making this a quick 2 0. Oh, it should have been a series taken away from Gen G, but it, it happens. The impossible comes through, and it is. Gen G clutching it through in this game too to make sure that it is not the closing of the door for them. It is D plus key, unfortunately. Not getting the job done, but what we have seen, well, from Hanwell Life and specifically Doran, he has been uh, T1's father and making sure that they are trying to leapfrog them in that standing. And the way that Showmaker, Lucid, and now 
aiming down in the bottom side the consistency that we are seeing from him one of the big things that we talk about with him is if you are getting that consistency from him his his level of play what he does contribute is is top tier but it's getting that at a consistent level getting that on a consistent level throughout the series is an important thing to keep track of and i think if you are uh d plus kia you are seeing that a lot more often from aiming in this resurgence for the team and i think that this is a d plus kia again seeing these type of strengthening signs from them seeing that strong performances from doran and a constant answers from hanwell life they certainly, for me, at the very least, passed T1 that has been stuck because of this losing streak. And that's where you can't just look at uh, purely the wins and losses because we just said Hanwa and T1 played two out of the last three. D-plus is matched up against Gen G in two of their last three series. Yes, they lost both of them. There was progress this time because they took a game off of them. But how competitive D-plus was against Gen G, and because they're such juggernauts in the LCK right now, you're left losing two out of three for D-plus and feeling pretty good about them. And you see how they play, and you, and you see how the series goes with Hanwha Life and T1 and the control that they have. It's hard to then take it to that next level and say, all right, now you're in a best of five series. Where are you going to find that pushback? Where are you going to find that thing that you can't find when it is just the best of three type of situation to, to push it to that limit? When you're feeling it out, you're looking at Hanwha Life, you're looking at D plus Kia, you're finding reasons, you're finding avenues that they are gonna be able to push a Gen G to that limit, to that testing point where they are gonna have to prove themselves. T1 at this point, from what we've seen from them, there's far too many mistakes to be able to push, uh, a, you know, let, let alone a Gen G at the very top, but even to push a Hanwha Life or a D plus Kia off of the edge. And again, there's a lot of time, and if there's any team that's going to turn things around on the flip of the switch, it's probably T1 of all the teams uh, in the world. But yeah, Genji, obviously just so... You have to play perfectly to close these games out. It's a ticking time bomb to see Chobi on his ear when he's got like 400 CS at 28 minutes. Ludicrous uh, minion numbers, but really want to highlight because Lucid played absolutely out of his mind in this series despite the loss. He was incredible, and the growth trajectory of this rookie has been a sight to see i think the individual thing to look at when you're talking about what lucid has done in these series in this window of just the you know against gen g as the opponent we've checked in with it because of the importance of canyon on the other side right and the legacy that he left with d plus kia and trying to fill those shoes and where you stack up against what is arguably the best guy at this position in the lck pretty good pretty good in that first one you know yes there st still absolutely was that answer that yes i am your father of, of from canyon but then you get to this next series and it is a drastic improvement from lucid one where he is building his own momentum for d plus kia and you gotta give that credit over to notice the change between this series and the first series for him two very different series uh, from the top dogs in the lcs but the same results it's a 4-0 start now for both cloud nine and team liquid we'll start on the tl side of things because this was the messier one it started looking like man team liquid is light years ahead of everybody else in the lcs dignitas bounces back and then we get the slobber knocker of a game three the zillion kindred combo out of dig throwing it back but this was speaker not blabber pilot in it and it felt like the kindred ulti with the zillion chrono shift never really came online that call yeah you know what they were trying to cook up but it didn't quite reach its point that you wanted to see out there on summoner's rift i think there is an importance to give credit over to dig especially with all the conversation around and Part of that from dig about what their expectations were heading into this matchup against team liquid to uh, and then to see how bad and how much in favor game one was for team liquid to then get that bounce back in game two and push us to the game three i want to give that credit over to dig and then we get into game three and as you laid out you have the draft come out the way that it does rolling through with the kindred uh, zillion combo trying to do the unkillable team type of situation for dignitas laid it out it never gets paired up at the right type of moments right situations the right layering of them on top of each other type of thing never comes through so that power doesn't really exist as that synergy for dignitas and it is very much a control team liquid takedown and honestly i was 
impressed. You know, I'm impressed whenever someone takes down APA Ziggs on a stage match. They get it in game two, but he runs it back in game three and they look completely outmatched like they'd never played against it before in terms of the disengage that it had. He was popping Spica out of the Kindred ulti with the satchel and I was just sitting there going, you just played against this pick last game. Did we forget already? I, I, that one was so frustrating because, you know, you, yes, you have that pick come through and then you get to see the mastery, the comfort, the familiarity on that champion from APA as the one that we always talk about him playing. You see it and you see it in this type of matchup knowing that, hey, OK, you're going to put down the lamb rest, but fine, I'm, I'm just going to boop you out of it here with the bomb. No problem. Ziggs solves it all. Team Liquid, not really too much of a problem. I think there is you know, a little bit certainly to clean up or a little speck of dust on, on the resume, but absolutely passing through still. Cloud9 definitely had some fun as well in their series against the 100 Thieves, but it was definitely the more clean 2-0. They had like an 8K gold lead at 15 minutes, I think, in game two. Uh, mainly, you're just looking to the mid lane as Jojo Pion had the most uh, head-scratching moments in some of these series, randomly getting solo killed, randomly getting caught out. But Thanatos had a fantastic series, and Vulcan, probably his best two games back-to-back -back that he's had since he rejoined Cloud9. This has to be your answer to anybody definitively, that Jojo Pyun, he's not a KDA player. We know that <laughs> one from seeing some of the fun that's going on in the mid lane, some of the question questionable things going on. But yes, you laid it out. Cloud9 pushing on through and really giving us a performance that uh, you know, is worthy of holding on to that number one spot or being in that argument for that number one spot with Team Liquid, the way that they played. You look at that bottom lane, you laid it out, Berserker and Vulcan. Vulcan specifically, for me, Berserker was great, but Vulcan even more so, I think, made some special plays in this series, and certainly he's been more so under the microscope looking for what type of player he is, what type of caliber we can estimate for him now, given everything that's happened over the last couple of years, you know, from Evil Geniuses to the FlyQuest situation, and then where we are now with Cloud9 and a lot of people having that tough start at the beginning, questioning whether he is this commodity that we thought he was heading into this team. This type of performance, I think he is what you thought he was and more given what he was able to give for Cloud9. I think the other thing that is important to check in with them, Mr. Thanatos up in the top side, getting it done on the croc. And how about this, when the Renekton is able to take away that blue buff early on? I mean, taking blue buff and soul killing the jungler, that's a scrim remake probably. Nine <laughs> times out of 10, these guys are doing. So because they got such a huge early lead, I think that's where some of the absolute four fun moments came, especially in that second game. That happens all the time, even with some of the best teams in the world when they get such an insane lead, uh, they kind of get a little sloppy, get caught out a few times. But two O's for the two top teams in the LCS. But the real star of the weekend was the blessed LCS Fiesta that we got from, shocker to no one, the Shopify Rebellion and NRG Esports. 140 minutes on the rift. Multiple Elder Dragons in each game. Multiple base defenses. This felt like vintage 2015 levels of sloppy LCS gameplay. I don't, I don't like any of the conclusions that I'm coming away with from this series. I think we talked about it for sure, and at least I will give the credit over. Energy steps away with the win in this series. Clean that was one of the 2 I don't know if I'm going to go that far, but certainly one of the things that we said was going to be necessary for them is taking care of this business with Shopify. And I'm not sure I'm going to qualify this as taking care of business, but I'm certainly going to at least put the check mark in and, and look away for NRG in this series and what they were able to do. A lot of unfortunate things I think they're looking at here with this one. I think for NRG, you're still left questioning how is this the team that was able to not only win last year, but able to beat G2 and make it through to the top eight the world championship and then on the second hand you're almost also then looking at shopify rebellion and you're questioning man why did shopify buy this team what are they doing here what type of you know i've not necessarily seen any content generated around them type of thing and it made me think back as you know we refresh into this timeline of the old lcs right looking back at the the old tsm clg cloud nine days and everything else and all the content that was around them and how you knew the players I think that uh, one, uh, certainly there are teams and organizations that are succeeding, that are doing it to that type of level and providing that content. 
Shopify Rebellion is certainly not that one for me. No, they definitely have not been turning out any way, shape, or form, any type of content, but they did deserve a win in this series. You feel they're now 0-8 in game score, but they played well enough or NRG played bad enough that uh, B-Boy deserved to win in this series. Bevo definitely deserved a win. I think it's unfortunate when you look at game two, the way that he played the stat line that he is able to generate and the advantages that are in favor for Shopify Rebellion just get completely wasted and outblasted by a scaling up Senna. Senna that reaches just enough stacks to have the distance to damage you from farther away than you ever wanted to see. And then, of course, it is still all down to the decision-making and play that happens around the Elder Dragon. You want to go for the base end. And, well, I could tell you, I think 9 out of 10 people would have been screaming at their TV saying, yeah, this base race ain't going to work. And that that, well, well, that last person, that 1 out of 10, he's telling you that, well, if you don't get Elder Dragon here, it's certainly not going to work. And, yes, they didn't get Elder, and it didn't work. A minor plus one with Boogie in the lineup. They look slightly better, but still, the result is the same. It is an 0-2 series loss. The result was looking like an 0-2 series loss for BLG as Kanavi was absolutely styling on your boy Jun in the Kha'Zix brand jungle matchup. But unfortunately for Jun, that meant it was ways theme song as he came in to make his debut for blg not only picks up the mvp in his first game but proceeds to reverse sweep jdg which means i'm sweating mightily if i'm sure now oh man it had the feeling of the you know the, the wwe royal rumble type of entrance for way stepping on on and the maokai of course oh, oh baby Yes, sir. We have uh, BLG Way stepping out onto the rift and making a difference in this series. And I think that this door has now been opened for BLG. You got the door stopper in there, man. It ain't closing any time soon right now. The way that Way was able to play and take control of this series and this team really for BLG uh, in this game when you want to examine it because you go to game one and you got Jun in there and you have Kha'Zix rolling around for Mr. Tarzan and what was going on and how much of a disruption Kanavi was able to be on this bug. He was bugging out, my man, making sure that it was going to be a win. And then you go to game two and it is way stepping in on the Maokai as we lay down. And maybe it's not the most impressive stat line, but the effect that he had and the wear that he was for this team, he facilitated masterly for this squad and what BLG was able to push through in game two and then extending in game three. It kind of felt like peak uh, BLG because it felt like JDG were doing everything right on the rift. They were taking control, they were playing things slowly and BLG just kept winning team fights that they probably shouldn't have won, which is kind of the play style and strategy that for so long of their dominance in the LPL they've been uh, perfecting. But uh, yeah, they and JDG just their second loss of the summer split and We'll see what the jungle swap saga goes between Jin and Wei as the spring split carries on, or summer split, excuse me. Uh, LEC playoffs came back, only got a pair of series on the Sunday with the wacky scheduling, thanks to Valorant over in Europe. Yes, League of Legends is a second fiddle esport now, but we had farewells to two squads, at least from the summer split, but for Team Heretics, they ain't going to the season finals, so it's the end of 2024 for the boys. They forced a game three at the very least against Giant X, but they were outmatched. And just, you never felt like this team really was a legit threat throughout summer. It kind of felt like a car that can't hit its full speedometer, right? It was only able to hang around and kind of just around that speed limit type of zone. You're like, yeah, but... Sometimes you gotta get on the highway. Sometimes you gotta go just a little bit above that speed limit to keep up with how the pace of everyone else is going. Never happened. That they didn't car trust was never the car. They thought it was gonna explode if they went on the uh, highway. Well, it exploded at the end of the day, at the end of the way things went. And I think a part of that explosion is the is the lighter that old Jackie's throws on, on uh, Zeri into it at that final team fight. I think what you're looking at with Heretics here, unfortunately, is you're talking about Wonder and Yankos as two of these older players in that top side that I think still showed you that they've got what it takes to hang around in the LEC, but both of them very much clearly 
needing the right opportunity, the right space to be surrounded by with all these other pieces and things going on where they can then have that effect, have that knowledge, all these type of things to help contribute and push that team over the top. This heretic situation was not that. And you go down to the bottom lane, you look at Flack and Trimby, and I think for both of them, they were okay, but okay is not going to be enough is the problem here for that one. And I think relatively, when you're talking about what you could have envisioned for them, what type of potential, I feel like they very slowly were crawling towards that one. And when you look around the rest of the LEC, we got people on e-bikes, scooters, and sprinters. We got everybody moving on past this Team Heretics. And... I mean, obviously, we'll revisit this. What does this mean for the future of Yankos? It's been like two years. Crazy to think that he's actually been on Team Heretics. It still feels like it's been uh, his first split. But we'll see what remains of that dive back into that. But yeah, Team Heretics, I never was going to have faith that this team could be a world's contender in the LEC. There just wasn't enough of that high-end power level that we ever saw out of them. Uh, the other matchup, probably more surprising, is how badly K-Corp beat down Mad Lions Koi, and the boys are lucky they made it to finals in winter, because otherwise they wouldn't be going to the season finals either. Holy cow. What a what a one to unpack in that type of situation, because you are absolutely right. That was a dominating series from K-Corp, and when a very uh, thorough answer that they are better than the Mad Lions Koi, and this is a Mad Lions Koi that has been all over the place throughout this year, but mostly, and unfortunately, in the negative territory on where they're hanging out and what type of performances you have seen from them and this is an extension of that one one of the one of these games where again you don't see the picture come together you're wondering really this is what you guys you know tinkered around with and wanted to put together the el yoya you know spanish super team this is it doesn't really come through out there on the riff when you're seeing some of these questionable uh, choices and performances i think specifically i think for scow we had a really rough series individually when you're looking at how things went not really the type of level that was going to stand up to the improved Carmine Corp in the way that they have gone through this summer split. Still need a miracle run for K-Corp. They need a top three finish to book a ticket in the season finals, which means two more best of series that they're going to have to win if they make their way through that miracle run. But that is it today for Liga Unlocked.